And with that, I'm really excited to to welcome Matt Presti to our ICR afternoon. Um, he's going to take us on a journey right along the lines of what we have already worked our way up towards in in this journey together, the exploration of consciousness. Um, Matt will talk to us about the progression of consciousness and how it is clearly evident through various ages in history, through various cultures, um, through various types of mystics and geniuses, which is uh, going to be fascinating for us because it ties right in with the type of work that we do in terms of literary research here at uh, ICR as well. Matt himself is a musician, a philosopher, a poet, a cosmologist, a practitioner of universal law, natural science and living philosophy. We just heard that he lives out in the woods, nicely isolated in nature and draws great strength from that. He is also a, a volunteer fireman. And he did share with me that he has recently opened the Russell Museum, which features over 40 tons of art and sculpture by Dr. Walter and Lau Russell that was stored away for nearly 21 years. And uh, Matt now, has been able to bring that back into into the, the public eye. Um, he is committed to preserving the Russell legacy for posterity. He enjoys gardening, alone time in nature, and a lot of creative outlets like writing music, poetry, producing videos, and so on. So we're very excited, Matt. We look forward to your talk and welcome to ICR. Thank you, Sabine, for the uh, generous introduction and welcome everyone. I'd like to send a special thanks out to Mr. Scott Heigel, who, because of him recommending me to the organization, I was able to secure a spot. I would have hoped to journey with him to be in person with you all, but if you can't be in person, then this is the next best thing to continue it on. A uh, special thanks to Paul and Dale, Michael, Sabine, um, fellow presenters, guests, and everyone at ICR. I get my uh, presentation loaded up here and we can begin. Okay, if someone could just confirm that they're seeing. Yeah, we can see it. Okay. Uh, this is entitled The Exploration of Consciousness. Um, I started a show, a podcast by the name, back in 2010 on my birthday. And a friend of mine said, Well, how can consciousness explore itself. I said the same way an eyeball can look into itself in the mirror. So uh, it was always a, a journey for me to try to figure out what was consciousness. And the answers that I discovered along this path were, were, were more than fulfilling. Um, I've always been one for praising the great existential questions of philosophy. Who am I? Why am I here? What is this we're in? and where are we going? And with that, I will move to, uh, if I can here, my disclaimer. And uh, let's see, I'm gonna move this over. There we go. As president of the University of Science and Philosophy and a volunteer firefighter on two departments, my conclusions regarding 25 years of research into various studies, fields of knowledge, and information presented here today do not necessarily reflect the organizations with which I am affiliated. And my use of the word man is inclusive of all mankind. Uh, God is the mother father light. So if I mention the word God, I don't, not referring to a, a male deity of 2000 years ago who uh, killed firstborn and cast lightning bolts at those he was displeased with. Um, so just say that, we'll move on to the first slide here of the actual presentation. And this is, of course, the opening of the riddle of consciousness. And I couldn't find a better quote, to be quite honest, because he says one thing in here that is most true from what my research has revealed to me as well. And the quote says, what I ever may seem to you, perhaps blasphemous, unbelievable or odd, for we are guilty of a common lapse when we forget that consciousness is God. When we ignore that what we see without and our self inside, with no room for doubt, are diverse facets 
or say, different shades of one eternal substance which pervades the whole creation everywhere the same, beneath the very dress of form and name. And what he says when he says, when we forget that consciousness is God, that is uh, really the, the core of what we're going to see in the next many slides to come. That consciousness, as it's been called by the various illuminates, mystics, even the great poets, the artists of um, multi-ages past, all agree that at the bottom in the, the core and the crux of their, their knowledge and wisdom and their teachings, whatever it may be, is they're expressing the consciousness. And they even, to a degree, have at least hinted to us that consciousness is God. And we'll go more into detail with that as we move along. I'm going to pull up a couple photos here to, to go into the first photos. In the beginning, ending, God. And what you're seeing on the left of the screen, the eternal omnipresent vacuum zero, these are both uh, drawings and illustrations by Dr. Walter Russell. Uh, these came out of his 39-day illumination, which I will uh, go into greater detail. But for now, just to know that Dr. Russell was the artist behind these illustrations. He shows us two universes, the reality of cause on the left. So we have the universe of cause and he names it the one white light of mind. And why is it white? Well, we're gonna get into that too. The real universe of knowing mind at rest is that one white light of mind. Uh, many people have referred to in classical illumination experiences that flash a blinding white light. And Dr. Russell and Leo Russell, with his experience, basically served to explain in a very great detail what that white light is, how it works, and how it actually defines God, which is, again, consciousness. So he calls it the still universe of cold. And as we know, space to our senses is dark. So when we look up at the night sky, we don't see white light, we see the darkness of space. But to the illuminate, whose senses are severed from his knowing mind, becomes holy mind and experiences the white light behind all creation, which is the cause of reality. He shows us on the right, the transient dynamic universe of matter, the illusion of effect, the spectrum lights of body. As you can see, there's galaxies and planets, planetoids. Um, you'll see uh, the unreal motion picture universe of thinking mind and action. He's not the first to use that term motion picture. Uh, Paramahansa Yogananda used it. He said the, the reality that we perceive with the senses is much like a motion picture. And this is what Dr. Russell termed being the body, the lights of body, as the hot universe of light and motion, or the dynamic universe of matter. And this is what he basically referred to as two kinds of light, the light of mind, which is white and blinding and not sensible to our senses. And then there's the divided light in the red and blue color spectrum, which is visible to our senses, which a prism reveals. So we'll move along. This slide is not blank. It's blank for a reason. I'm showing you basically the screen of space. If you could turn the space in the sky that you see, the space between you and I, the space between your cells and inside your cells between the DNA strands, the multitude of space is so much greater than matter. But if you could see it for what it truly is, you would know that the universe is the mind, that it is God, that God is consciousness, and you're looking now at the screen of space. It could be much likened to a motion picture screen or a movie screen. Everybody's been to see the movies here. Um, I doubt anybody hasn't been to a movie theater and seen the white screen in the movie theater. Why is the screen white? Because it's the only color that will reflect a divided color spectrum. If the screen was black, you wouldn't see half of the movie. 
uh, if not more. So because the white screen of space is dark to our senses, scientists, of, especially of the materialist philosophy, will say it doesn't exist. Uh, one of the main principles that Dr. Russell stressed is that God was 90 degrees to motion. In other words, the fulcrum, that which does not move. You'll notice that your door moves on a fulcrum, your wheels on your car move on a fulcrum that does not move, and you too, yourself, in the very center of your being, move upon an identical fulcrum. That fulcrum is the equilibrium upon which all motion moves, and it's always at 90 degrees. Here we see an actual photo, Hubble telescope photo. And what I'm going to do here with the next slide is show you a selfie of God, which was an idea I came up with after seeing the first two pictures that we looked at, which was the one white light of mind. I thought to invert a galaxy and actually expose the creator. And this is what it is. Now, if you could imagine this white light being in and through everything, you can scientifically now understand the presence of the conscious field, which is in and through everything. This, this is a great slide to explain the, the consciousness that is God, which is omnipresent, omnipotent, and omniscient. That is the field of all knowledge, the field of all presence, and the field of all timelessness. The Russells and Atomic Suicide define God. This is the first chapter I've ever read in any book anywhere, Atomic Suicide, and it was on page 107, and I was blown back by turning to that page and seeing the words, we define God as the chapter heading. I was like, this is, okay, this is going to be really good. So actually, and it was, um, I like to say of that book that it melted my brain, but uh, Going into the quote of how they define God, God is light and God is love and God is inexorable law. God is the invisible, motionless, sexless, undivided, and unconditioned white magnetic light of omnipotent, omniscient, and omnipresent mind. The one white light, which you'll see several slides of this title, because I want to drive this point home. Um, the, in, the idea is that one light. Idea is bulletproof. Why is it bulletproof? Because it doesn't exist. Idea is something only the mind can conceive. Now the unfolding of idea is, requires the unfoldment into the hemispheres. Uh, your left hemisphere, your right hemisphere. Your left and right hands work to carve a block of wood, but that idea and the image of it is within your mind. It was Rene Descartes who said, the pineal is the seat of the soul. And this picture kind of shows that. So the pineal is um, considered the seat of the soul by the Russells in their teachings as well. Now, some have argued that it's actually the pituitary, but the pineal going back through history, we'll see hieroglyphs and bas reliefs, uh, even in the, around the Catholic church of the pine cone so that the seat of the soul and the pine cone and how it was venerated in ancient societies, even up to today, is apparent that that is a possibility for the seat of the soul. An axiom put forth from Walter and Leo Russell in the Home Study Course, third edition, idea is a part of the eternal, uncreated, and undivided white mind light which God is, while idea bodies are spectrum divided extensions of that undivided white light, which centers every wave of them. God's knowing is that one white light, but God's thinking is the divided octave wave spectrum of the four pairs of spectrum lights, which extend from that white light, four on each side, which constitute the thought bodies of mind thinking and mind imagining. It has not yet entered within human consciousness to think of matter as thought bodies or of waves as pure thought recordings, which God, the sole teacher, makes use of to intercommunicate with every thought body in the moving universe. 
neither does it occur to anyone that everything in the universe is constantly talking to every other thing, nor telling it what it is, what it is doing, and what its purpose is. An apple, for example, does not need to say in words, I am an apple. Its form, color, odor, and taste tell you that without need of words, but you identify that apple idea by giving it a word in man's language. If you will but learn to look up upon creation as an assemblage of many ideas and realize that the only knowledge you can ever acquire is an awareness of the nature and purpose of each and every created thing, as well as the processes used in the creation of that thing, you will soon realize that you are forever talking to nature and nature is forever talking to you. The more you do this, the more you acquire God awareness, for God is nature. And that is what we mean by cosmic thinking, for cosmic thinking is actually talking to God as God is forever talking to you in his universal language of light. And that's an incredible statement, but that's uh, just one excerpt of the home study course, which is the flagship curriculum for the University of Science and Philosophy, written by the Russells, uh, 1950s. And basically, it leads you to a point where you realize of your moment-to-moment -moment connection to the divine. You, you no longer, and with the right mindful practice, you no longer feel disconnected or like God is far from you. And that can go a long way for a lot of people in this world to know that God is always with them. Again, knowing is the prime actuality, the undivided, the stillness, the silence. Again, knowing could be a way of, you know, there's many synonyms that the Russells would use to connote God, what it means, and all of those under the, the listing of knowing are those words. Power, the uncreated, the undivided, the unconditioned, the formless, the sexless, the timeless, the white magnetic light, idea, oneness, love, life, cause, God. When divided, it becomes thinking. It becomes an expression of power, action, light waves, wave lever, electricity, imagination, father, mother, division of idea, giving, regiving, life, death, expression, and desire in God. Concentration and, the, and a neologism that Dr. Russell himself coined, decentration, which is the opposite. Uh, it is raining here, so if you hear a little bit of static sounding noise in the background, I think Chuck may have sent that thunderstorm up from Austin, but nonetheless, we'll, we'll make do. Uh, the result of thinking is then product. Uh, product is the result of a record of action. Matter, motion, reflection, the unreal image, the form bodies, projection, repetition, rebirth, effect, temporality, or what we would rather or, or most often call the universe itself. Now, the knowing that is the cause of all this is not in the product. You will not find Leonardo da Vinci in the Mona Lisa painting. You will not find Beethoven in his fifth symphony. You will, however, see a reflection of his thinking, which stems from his knowing. So you will hear Beethoven, you will see Beethoven in his, his art, but you will not find his soul in the droplets of paint nor the notes of music. Uh, Leonardo in the painting, uh, Beethoven in the notes, they're not there. The soul of them are there, however, and that is where knowing is broken into thinking to become the product. There's a very um, applicable process to creation. The one white light again, from Giordano Bruno, the divine light is always in man, presenting itself to the senses and to the comprehension, but man rejects it. Well, the church rejected Giordano, Giordano, Giordano Bruno, and he was burned at the stake for what he tried to teach to his fellow man. This is a graphic I created. Uh, the images of the man and the equator belong to Dr. Russell. But if you unfold a cube, which the entire science of the, Russell, of the Russells is cube and sphere, the two building blocks of all creation, if you unfold a cube, you, you, you get the cross in two dimensions. 
And as you can see, the equator of the, of the man in the, in the illustration is dead center, straight down the middle of the body. And you see a mirror image called a hemisphere on each side. As you can see, the vertical awareness or the Godhead is all those terms are basically synonymous. You'll see conscience, light, eternity, absolute cold, zero curvature, the plane of the cube, intuition, instinct, inspiration. I won't read them all, but basically that's balance. Motion is sensation. That is the seesaw. How many people in this world ride that seesaw and never come to the awareness of the vertical, of the Godhead? So going vertical, I like to say, is a great goal, and that's something we should all strive for. When you get behind motion as the vertical, you become that Godhead, then you can command motion to serve you as opposed to motion commanding you and suffering it and its unbalances. From the Bhagavad Gita, if the light of a thousand suns suddenly arose in the sky, that splendor might be compared to the radiance of the Supreme Spirit. Again, the blinding white light. The one white light to stress again, and this is a, a piece from the autobiography of Paramahansa Yogananda. He's speaking in particular of his experience of that white light. He writes, I cognize the center of the Empyrean as a point of intuitive perception in my heart, a radiating splendor issued from my nucleus to every part of the universal structure. Blissful Amrita, nectar of immortality, pulsated through me with a quicksilver like fluidity. The creative voice of God I heard resounding as Aum, the vibration of the cosmic motor. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, John 1.1. 1, 1. Suddenly the breath returned to my lungs. With a disappointment almost unbearable, I realized that my infinite immensity was lost. Once more I was limited to the humiliating cage of a body, not easily accommodated to the spirit. Like a prodigal child, I had to run away from my macrocosmic home and had imprisoned myself in a narrow microcosm. My guru, Sri Yukteswar, was standing motionless before me. I started to prostrate myself at his holy feet in gratitude for his having bestowed on me the experience in cosmic consciousness that I had long passionately sought. He held me upright and said quietly, you must not get over drunk with ecstasy. Much work yet remains for you in this world. Come, let us sweep the balcony floor, then we shall walk by the Ganges. That's not quite what you want to hear after having a divine illumination of such intense magnitude. Come, let's sweep the balcony floor. But that, that struck me as, as almost a, a hilarity because it reminds me of a saying that I'll close this talk with, but you know, he's telling us that, my God, I just cognized the center of the Empyrean point of heaven, yet I have to now go sweep the floor. So interesting little parallel there. Again, another example of the one white light from author Ralph Waldo Emerson. A man should learn to detect and foster that gleam of light which flashes across his mind from within, far more than the luster of the whole firmament without. Yet he dismisses without notice his peculiar thought because it is peculiar. From Gopi Krishna in the Riddle of Consciousness, this is his experience. Of illumination. The shoreless ocean of consciousness in which I was now immersed appeared infinitely large and infinitely small at the same time, large when considered in relation to the world picture floating in it, and small when considered in itself, measureless, without form or size, nothing and yet everything. I was intensely aware of, internally of a marvelous being so concentratedly and massively conscious as to outluster and outstature infinitely the cosmic image present before me, not only in point of extent and brightness, but in point of reality and substance as well. At the point of the deepest penetration, assumed such an awe-inspiring, almighty, all-knowing, blissful, and at the same time absolutely motionless, 
intangible and formless character that the invisible line demarcating the material world and the boundless all conscious reality cease to exist, the two fusing into one, the mighty ocean sucked up by a drop, the enormous three-dimensional universe swallowed by a grain of sand, the entire creation, the knower and the known, the seer and the, and the seen, reduced to an inexpressible sizeless void which no mind could conceive nor any language describe. From William Blake, if the doors of perception were cleansed, everything would appear to man as it is, infinite, for man has closed himself up till he sees all things through narrow chinks of his cavern. Home Study Course, third edition. This is Dr. Russell's um, actual experience in his own writing of that 39 day incredible period of time that he experienced the light. The great light of my first and seventh illumining again came and again I found my universality in that ecstasy which is the only emotion of the God nature. That ecstasy is the one unchanging and constant mind state which inspired man always feels in invariable intensity, variable intensity as measured by the intensity of his inspiration. Owing to man's lack of knowledge of God's electric universe and man's relationship to it, no man of past ages has ever been able to give a satisfactory explanation of that instantaneous flash of red-orange light, which completely blinded me for an undeterminable interval, which was followed by a feeling of being bathed in a great sea of blue. You'll hear a lot of yogis and a lot of even meditative practitioners describe the blue, the blue, the blue dot or the blue... Uh, flame. The explanation of that light flash which Paul and other cosmic conscious men have experienced is that there is an electric short circuit between the two lobes of the brain which causes a flash of light at the instance of severance of consciousness from electric sensation of the body. Such a flash occurs at the moment of death in all cases and has been photographed many times. Usually the cosmic illumination has duration of a few minutes or hours, leaving an aftermath of a few days, but no matter how brief it is, it completely transforms one into another higher being. My usual period through life has been about 10 days following the first intensive few hours, but this 1921 period lasted for 39 days and nights, beginning on May 10th and ending June 19th. The light of spiritual consciousness centers the divided or polarized light which constitutes the electric awareness of sensation in a body. So that's just an incredible story and he goes on to write about it for about six or eight more pages in the home study course. Uh, another excerpt from that, the first and most conspicuous effect of illumination into full cosmic consciousness is the utter absence of evil, sin, or shame. There is no thought of such an unbalanced condition while in the one ecstatic condition of perfect balance, which the light of love is. Illumination into the light means just that, for it is the light of all knowing or the light of love which is manifested by thinking God's all-knowing into complexities of pattern form. I instantly and timelessly knew that the still undivided divine light of God, which is the fulcrum of life and power, and I also I knew the heartbeat of the divided light wave universe, which manifests love, life, and power in matter. And I also knew that mind and soul and God were one. Hey, this is from Emily Bronte, and one of the great things that when you begin to recognize the thread, the golden thread that weaves through all these accounts, is you'll begin to also be able, if you haven't experienced an illumination yourself, if you've had an inspiration of any kind in your life, you've definitely had a divine illumination. Inspiration is the language of light, as Dr. Russell said. Um, and basically, an inspiration is a mini illumination. It doesn't always have to, to be something that you completely sever, uh, you know, the, or fuse the hemispheres of the brain through an electric short circuit. 
you're actually having a divine illumination even with minor inspirations. It's just a minor illumination. So everybody is very capable of having them. The thing is that when we start to feel an inspiration come about, we tend to go and do something else instead of follow that feeling through. This is from Emily Bronte, and I won't read the whole thing, but I'll just go about halfway down. And this is just proof positive that she was one, again, another uh, person who, as you know, an illuminate in her own right through her poetry. She wrote, to wake and doubt in one holding so fast by thine infinity, so surely anchored on the steadfast rock of immortality. With wide embracing love, the spirit animates eternal years, pervades and broods above, changes, sustains, dissolves, creates and rears. Though earth and man were gone and suns and universes ceased to be and thou wert left alone, every existence would exist in thee. Again, think of that God selfie, the omnipresent white light in and through everything. There is not room for death, nor Adam that his might could render void. Thou, thou art being and breath, and what thou art may never be destroyed. Nikola Tesla, my brain is only a receiver. In the universe, there is a core from which we obtain knowledge, strength, inspiration. I have not penetrated into the secrets of this core, but I know it exists. Here's another one. He speaks of the strong flashes of light, the images uh, he had when he drew his AC motor in the ground in Serbia in a park with a stick in front of his friend. He actually had a, a flash of light happen and he saw the motor completed in his mind. The only task he had to do at that point was build it. There's just example after example, and that's part of the reason for the presentation, is it happens to people of all walks of life, male, female. Unfortunately, the accounts of the females of, of the illumination experience are not that well um, documented. I think due to the fact that uh, for many years and centuries, uh, mostly male authors uh, were granted privileges of writing books. Emily Bronte was one who had to disguise her name and her two sisters along with her uh, in order to write those books. They had to uh, actually parade as men, but nonetheless, they helped to break the stereotype, you know, so that was uh, an amazing thing in and of itself. Uh, from Black Elk, and while I stood there, I saw more than I can tell, and I understood more than I saw, for I was seeing in a sacred manner the shapes of all things in the spirit, and the shape of all shapes, as they must live together like one being. The great mystic Lao Tzu, to a mind that is still, the whole universe surrenders. Matt, this is your five minutes. Okay, thank you. Again, Nikola Tesla, gift of mental power comes from God, divine being. If we concentrate our minds on that truth, we become in tune with this great power. Walter Leo Russell, the more you can become illumined with your cosmic consciousness, the more you will find yourself using God's mind as your mind. George Washington Carver, our creator is the same and never changes despite the names given him by people here and in all parts of the world. He would be there still within us, awaiting to give us good on this earth. Christian mystic Hildebard, Hildegard von Bingham, we cannot live in a world that is not our own, in a world that is interpreted for us by others. An interpreted world is not home. Part of the terror is to take back our own listening, to use our own voice, to see our own light. So as consciousness awakens, Consciousness is a seed always begins with simplicity, the creator or field of consciousness is infinite white light. As is awakening from sleep, we are born into the world of divided matter and motion, duality and opposites. Our task is to unify, to find triality. As we grow like a tree, for instance, we unfold our uniqueness and individuality. We begin to complexify as our consciousness unfolds from its slumber and seed. It is no wonder there is so much focus on humanity waking up, as it were. Kundalini is a conscious process. Think of the root, trunk, branches, leaves, fruit, seed, treetop, 
Kundalini is not one thing and consciousness another. And this thought just came to me this morning. It is an act of consciousness, an expression of the mother father light within mankind, localized around the spinal cord, culminating in an awakening experience. Consciousness in all surface life seems to aspire toward the heavens above. If it does not come to the surface, it remains base. Manly P. Hall, when the mob governs, man is ruled by ignorance. And I'll just leave it there. Um, basically what he's saying is that collective consciousness is sort of what the individual has to rise out of. And we might look out at the world and see a lot of collective consciousness doing very destructive things, and it's unfortunate. But as individuals, one thing the United States has afforded is the soil for genius to emerge. Um, no, no system's perfect, but there's always potential where there's hope and where um, the individual seeks to better himself and by bettering himself lifts others in that effort. Everyone thinks of changing the world, but no one thinks of changing himself, Leo Tolstoy. Seven hermetic principles, those align again with the Kundalini or the chakra system. Carl Jung wrote, when you succeed in awakening the Kundalini so that it starts to move out of its mere potentiality, you necessarily start a world which is totally different from our world. It is the world of eternity. I'm just going to quickly cycle through these pictures and I should be able to wrap up my presentation in about two minutes. So 33 vertebrae to the spine. The spine is the one bone structure that is center to the entire body and singular. So it is a fulcrum bone. Many things, uh, past drawings from the ages, alchemical drawings. It's my favorite quote from the master alchemist Falconelli. The vital thing is not the transmutation of metals, but that of the experimenter himself. It is an ancient secret that a few people rediscover each century. Unfortunately, only a handful are successful. I think he's basically talking about divine illumination, the coming to the knowledge that the kingdom of heaven is within man. From simple to complex, what is true must also be simple. Dr. Russell wrote, I believe that the basic cause of motion is extremely simple and easy to understand. I believe that the effects of motion are infinitely complex and extremely difficult to comprehend. I believe that anyone who understands, who thoroughly understands cause can also understand the complex effects of cause. All battles are first won or lost in the mind, Joan of Arc. So the solution-oriented mind, Ushin from the, if I'm correct, uh, Hindi, which means union. One who knows cause behind all motion lives to command the wave. He knows the wave as the simulated body of consciousness. He holds life in one hand and death in the other and may command both at will. He commands matter to become divine, imbuing it with his own soul, freezing his thoughts into the forms of his imaginings. All is light to the awakened mind. Shadow is the unconscious in man alone. His primary purpose is to enlighten first his own mind, and to that degree, those around him shall also be uplifted by his individuated effort. Because of this effort, all mankind is brought higher and closer to God consciousness. To reach enlightenment, one must chop wood and carry water. After enlightenment, one must still chop wood and carry water. Let us sweep the floor, then go for a walk in nature. Thank you very much. I know if we were in the tent, you would again get a rousing uh, round of applause. Thank you so much, Matt. It is fascinating to me to see the universal universality of this because you touch on a number of things that we also touch on in our literary research. Thank you for guiding us through seeing the symbolism of Kundalini and many cultures and many mystics and many geniuses. And, uh, and uh, your fascinating story. We really appreciate it. Thank you very um, much. Hopefully you can join us for the panel discussion a little bit later. I'm sure there'll be some interesting questions. Yes, I'd love to. Coming your way. Thank you.